When people think of the harm that wealthy and powerful countries cause to people throughout the world, they are most likely to be thinking of warfare. But rich countries also have considerable power over the lives of billions of people through their dominance of global governance organizations such as IMF and World Bank. Despite the bank and funds efforts to depict themselves as beacons of knowledge and expertise on development and macroeconomic challenges, both organizations have been and continue to be the target of harsh academic, UN, and civil society criticism. People have protested against the IMF in country after country that has borrowed from it, be it Argentina, Ecuador, Egypt, Greece, Jordan, Kenya, Nigeria, Pakistan, or Tunisia. They frequently accuse the IMF, the world's last resort lender, of promoting debt imperialism and worsening economic inequality. So, why are the IMF and the World Bank so controversial? Why do people dislike them? Before we get there, let's start from the beginning. The World Bank Group and the International Monetary Fund were both founded in 1944. They are intergovernmental organizations, IGOs, that shape the global development and financial order. They were originally founded with the goal of recreating the international economic system after World War II and are known as the Bretton Woods Institutions, BWIs. The key decisions that led to the establishment of IMF and World Bank were largely steered by the US and to a lesser extent the UK, and were heavily influenced by the US's geopolitical dominance during the post-war period. Coming to their missions and objectives, the World Bank assists developing nations in reducing poverty and increasing shared prosperity, while the IMF helps to stabilize the international monetary system and monitors global currencies. And in this way, the two organizations collaborate to ensure a stable global trade and payment system. While the World Bank and IMF were established as an apolitical effort to rebuild the world economy following World War II, some analysts view them as an attempt to defend or expand the reach of Western capitalism in the face of a potential threat from the Soviet Union, as well as to promote U.S. interests in particular. The World Bank's and IMF's missions, priorities, and programs have all evolved greatly over time. Since the 1970s, more frequent financial crises, particularly the 2008 crisis, have had an impact on the IMF's work, forcing it to shift away from primarily national interventions and toward a greater focus on the global economy, as well as from scanning the horizon for potential crises to dealing with them in order to avoid regional or global contagion. The World Bank's mission has also evolved considerably, from its early focus on infrastructure finance for the Washington Consensus and post-Washington Consensus to the Knowledge Bank, where it attempted to promote itself as a reservoir of development expertise. The World Bank's current activity is based upon two objectives, eliminating extreme poverty by 2030 and increasing shared prosperity. On the other hand, IMF's current declared objectives are to promote international fiscal and monetary cooperation, to ensure international financial stability, to facilitate international commerce, and to promote high employment and long-term economic growth. It intends to accomplish this by offering loan programs to countries with balance of payments issues, as well as policy advice through technical support and bilateral and multilateral macroeconomic surveillance. Under the Heavily Indebted Poor Countries HIPC initiative and the Multilateral Debt Relief Initiative, the IMF and the World Bank collaborated to lower the external debt burdens of the world's poorest countries, MDRI. To date, debt relief packages under the HIPC initiative have been authorized for 36 of the 39 nations that are eligible, totaling $76 billion in debt relief over time. The IMF and the World Bank continue to work together to help low-income nations achieve their development goals while avoiding debt issues in the future. Now, you must be thinking, where does the IMF or World Bank get its money, and how do they function? So, let's answer that for you. The IMF and the World Bank Group earn money in two ways. The first comes from their loan activities, which primarily charge borrowing countries, while the second comes from their financial market investments. Additionally, members contribute to the International Development Association IDA. Member nations provide resources for IMF loans to its members on non-concessional terms, primarily through the payment of quotas. 
After setting aside a liquidity buffer and considering that only resources of members with strong external positions are used for lending, the IMF's current overall resources of roughly SDR 973 billion translate into a capacity for lending of around SDR 707 billion, around US $1 trillion. Now, the main thing to highlight here is that IMF and World Bank, without a doubt, are among the most important and influential norm setters, conveners, knowledge holders, and influencers in the international development and financial environment. And while they have long been viewed as a weapon of political and economic power in the United States and other Western countries, their purpose and relevance has been continually questioned. So, why is the IMF or World Bank so unpopular? despite the fact that one of its main responsibilities is to provide resources to member countries in need. John Perkins, a chief economist and advisor at World Bank, IMF, and United Nations, have also talked about the show they put on to hide the cruel reality that is going behind the curtains. John Perkins has written a book called Confessions of an Economic Hitman, in which he tells his story of landing a job at an international consultation firm that was working for organizations like USAID and World Bank. The organization instilled in him the belief that it helped underprivileged people all over the world by raising them out of poverty and improving their living conditions. He was very much inspired by the company's dedication and hence worked really hard. However, a few years later, he was able to see through the doing good facade of the organization. He eventually realized that what he was really doing was just using fancy economic studies to persuade leaders of countries around the world to accept massive loans from the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, or one of their sister organizations. And these loans would put the countries in a debt trap. To repay them, the country would have to sell its oil or other resources at a low price to our firms, or meet other conditions that benefited what was quickly becoming an American empire. He also confessed that on the behalf of their organization, they would compel countries to restructure their loans and sell their oil and other resources cheaply to our firms without regard for environmental or social restrictions by collaborating with the International Monetary Fund, IMF. In fact, in the beginning, he thought he was doing the right thing, but then, over time, he began to notice that these econometric models and statistics they were using favored the wealthy only, and hence, the gap between the rich and the poor was rapidly growing. One of the most common criticisms that the World Bank and IMF face is the political power imbalances in their governance structures, where poorer countries, often those receiving loans from these two, are structurally underrepresented in decision-making processes. As a result, the IMF determines how much debtor countries are allowed to spend on education, healthcare, and environmental protection. The loans force member nations to pursue risky domestic economic policies, which further delays important reforms and encourages long-term dependency. For example, during the Asian crisis of 1997, the IMF forced many countries, including Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, to follow a strict monetary, higher interest rates, and fiscal policy to decrease the budget deficit and improve exchange rates. However, as a result of these actions, a small downturn turned into a major recession with extremely high unemployment. Argentina was forced into a similar economic austerity policy in 2001. This resulted in a decrease in public sector investment, which harmed the economy. A second stream of long-standing criticisms has focused on the content of the BWI's policies, programs, and projects, and how they have damaged a wide range of human rights. Many of the World Bank-funded projects have been proven to be in flagrant breach of international human rights standards on numerous occasions. News of indigenous people's rights being violated, human rights advocates being targeted, local food instability and major labor rights violations such as child and forced labor are apparently being attached to the bank-funded projects. Lastly, the World Bank and IMF's approach to development and economic policy, as well as their financing decisions, have sparked more pressing criticisms about environmental protection and mitigating climate change. Even after signing the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, the bank continues to promote projects that are part of major carbon-intensive megacorridors and funds a significant number of fossil fuel projects. The bank's forest policy and poor forest protection safeguards have been critiqued not only for infringing on local populations' rights, 
but also for failing to conserve one of the world's most important carbon sinks. Hence, the policies of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund have failed to fulfill their declared goals, instead supporting an economic order that enriches elites and private sector interests at the expense of poor and marginalized people. However, both the institutions continue to deny their involvement in establishing the social, political, and economic conditions that have contributed to the frustration and disenfranchisement that have brought them to this point. Apart from these reasons, much of the bitterness comes from the World Bank and IMF's conditions for loans and debts. The structural changes tied to IMF loans are quite conventional. However, the countries are expected to finish what they have been working on for decades in just a few years. Moreover, people despise the World Bank and the IMF because they serve as the agents for the international capital mafia. So, on the surface, this looks to be generous, but the funds are only given to countries that agree to engage U.S. construction corporations, ensuring that only a few people benefit. Furthermore, the loans are purposefully too large for any developing country to repay, and this debt burden virtually ensures that the developing country will support U.S. political goals. If you found this video informative and enjoyed the content, make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the like button as well. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask us. We will be happy to answer them for you. Thank you for watching.